What is up, champion puppy owners? Do you really want to streamline ownership experience? Do you really want to socialize dog with manners, responsiveness, and general life skills? Great, you're in the right place. This podcast is for accountable puppy owners who want to better know and grow their dogs. Time to put on your big girl panties, buckle up, and ride with me. Pat Quinn, the founder and creator of the Champion Puppy Training System. Let's go. Welcome to my first ever Champion Puppy Training Podcast. So a little bit about my background before we delve into things. I've been a trainer for 15 years. I also have a background in business. I have two children and I like to train and teach through analogies. So as much as dog training can be about what to do when you're actually working with your dog, here's my first analogy for you. It's a lot like football where you're not just going to win the game on the field on Sunday. You got to win every every rep in the gym. You have to eat right. You have to sleep right. You got to come together in the locker room. You have to visualize. You have to look at film. There's so many other things that I could go into, I'm sure, about how winning teams win. Obviously, one of the biggest ones, I'm sure, is attitude. And so it's not just a matter of having your puppy do something or sometimes not do something, but it's more a matter of approach both philosophical approach as well as just the general management. So uh, you'll see as we go through this, I have a a decent amount of analogies or um, I'll steal from my experience as a business owner, um, as I do have uh, boarding facilities and daycare facilities and a background in, in sales and marketing in the healthcare industry. I'll steal from my experience in sports both as like uh, from a coaching standpoint as and as an athlete, and also from a parenting standpoint. I, I think that there's a lot of carryover in our approach to growing a dog as there is to growing a company, growing yourself, growing um, you know children that you're responsible for. So you'll hear a lot of analogies in this podcast. What to expect? Um, it's going to be a lot of uh, me going over one specific hot topic. You'll probably see that I will go down some some other avenues as I'm just kind of throwing out my views on things. So you'll have to kind of know that I'll always bring it back to the point at hand. This podcast is intended for the owner who's probably at a temporary point of their life, a season where they have a new puppy that they either just acquired, just rescued, and they need to get out of the woods. They want to intensely commit and create a change. Uh, They want to make an investment. So that's my first target audience would be you you puppy owner who um, feel like you have your hands full. You, You have some puppy owning anxiety where you don't want to screw this dog up. Maybe your dog's kicking your butt a little bit, you know, nipping you and Maybe you're you're cleaning up more more poop and pee than what you thought you'd have to. My goal is, is to connect you with your puppy. The other um, audience this is for is for the dog trainer. Um, I know that there's not a ton of long running podcasts out there that uh, can provide some great ideas, like to help you just better wrap your head around um, your approach to growing great dogs. A lot of the podcasts I've seen, they just go down like the, the run of the mill, you know, uh, like hands on work. It's all so basic that, that you probably already know. So it's going to go a little bit deeper than that. Ideally, you'd probably be maybe like doing something while you're listening to this podcast because I'm going to go down some rabbit holes. I'm going to give you my perspective. I believe that I have enough hours invested in, into my career where if I can spend some time with you on the treadmill, in the car, um, while you're you know, d- doing something. So uh, this is probably the, a better podcast to you know, pop on your headphones or you know, plug it into your car and, um, and, and be doing something for a half hour, 40 minutes or so versus just you know, sitting there actively listening. The reason I think that's important is because when I grow, I grow through a multitude of ways. I, um, I, I don't read that much because I don't have that much time to sit down. I try to use my time very efficiently. It seems like the second I start reading, I fall asleep. <laughs> but it is something that I, I, I attempt to do while I go on like vacations or, or I'm out traveling with my family. 
I can tell you I bought books just to say, you know, I've tried to read this book for a few months and I just break down and buy the audio book. So anyway, you, you're going to grow in a couple different ways, I believe. Uh, I think through watching videos. In this day and age, videos are huge. So I think that you, the, the dog trainer, the, um, the puppy owner, can grow by watching videos, um, by listening to this, um, and by doing some hands-on work. But what the videos do, what the audio does, is it has you prepped to react accordingly or think differently in the moment while you're with your puppy. So look at this as planting seeds. Don't look at this as the end all be all, but it's going to, again, have you better be able to wrap your head around uh, what makes your puppy tick. Have you ready for those forks in the road as, as you're developing your puppy's behavior. So my pastor, Pastor Andrew, you'll hear me refer to him every once in a while. Pastor Andrew always says, you don't grow a church in lines, you grow them in circles. And what he means by that is, uh, and often encourages um, his flock to do is not just come on Sunday morning, but to do what, what we refer to as my church, what we refer to in my church is grow groups where you're meeting up with a men's group or um, like Financial Peace University or you're, you're doing um, a specific group um, where you're in circles and you're talking and you're getting to know the person who you're shaking the hand out on Sunday and smiling at, but you're actually getting to get in deep with these people and, and know them better. And obviously, most importantly, um, for church's sake, uh, have a better relationship with your Savior. So I believe the same is true with getting off that puppy owning, puppy training treadmill. There's plenty of lines you can be in in regards to looking to create change in your puppy. But I truly believe that in a community of other puppy owners, you can enhance uh, your understanding and relationship with your puppy. And this is, you know, kind of like growing in circles versus, you know, growing in just showing up on Sunday and going through the motions. So let's get deep. What my background is, is I have 15 years of hands-on training. Um, but before that, I volunteered every weekend while I was in college at the shelter. My wife and I, we actually got engaged at the shelter. It was, it sounds horrible, but it was very, there's a lot of setup before um, before uh, uh, she came into the kennel and I was on a bended knee with the news cameras there and the newspaper, my buddy there, um, you know, kind of waiting for her. Um, and there was a great setup after the fact as well. So, um, but anyway, uh, the Lancaster Humane League is where we spent our weekends in college. I, I acquired a handful of dogs in college. My, my place was, it, it, my house was a fun house. Let me put it that way. And all were welcomed. I acquired a couple of dogs along the way just from people who couldn't handle their dogs. And my wife being a dog person, it's like ever since she was little, she would have her, um, her parents pull over in, on the side of the road in Philadelphia just to pet dogs. Um, and was just always just has loved, loved, loved dogs, like intensely, like the truest form of love and happiness. Uh, and I, I had the dogs and believe me, I loved them, but I wasn't like eccentric. I wasn't a dog person. My wife brought out my inner dog person. I believe she was put in my life for many reasons. Her kind of breathing this uh, like life into me uh, of like, uh, just this excitement level about um, caring for dogs, you know, their betterment. And I've kind of taken that path that she she started me down. And I'm, I'm a self-improvement junkie. Uh, one of the things that upsets me more than anything in the world is having potential be squandered. You know, growing up, I, I was I was a bad little kid. You know, pretty much I was just that, that devilish little kid uh, for as long back as anybody can remember. Um, and just always getting into stuff and, you know, ADHD and, and if, if a teacher was at an easy spirit about him or her, uh, normally it was a her, then I would be a decent kid. But if, if a teacher was easily upset or anything like that, oh, I love to be in a limelight even more than the spotlight. So that worked out well. The reason why I mentioned that is I see in these puppies the same thing I, I'm sure some of my teachers and uh, adults that cared about me when I was younger, and this, again, devilish little eight-year-old, 10-year-old, 12-year-old, that's where it got interesting. And there was ones that could just, through sheer elegance of approach, get the best out of me. 
um, in a way that wasn't even direct, but it was just in a, in a nice, light, caring manner. And then 95% of the other adults in my life just got ticked off at me. And I see that with my training clients, where you have these dogs that are just full of life and vigor that are really good dogs, but there's just the inability to connect. And so what's nice is I get to take these dogs that are can sometimes be a little bit devilish, mischievous, and be able to, in an elegant way, do with those five percenters in my life. Um, and I can tell you which, which teachers, which um, music teachers, which coaches they were. You know, I had a swim coach that just, he didn't mess around. You know, when he told you to do something, you just did it. I had a music teacher that was just a sweetheart. Um, and then I had an elementary school teacher that I, got, I had twice, not because I failed, but she went from second grade to fourth grade and because I was so bad, but I was so, you know, at least decent for her, they put me in her class, um, in the fourth grade class. So I almost think that Miss um, Hadley got her um, change of grade just because I was so bad. So my apologies for that, or I don't know, maybe she liked fourth grade better than second grade. Anyway. So my wife brings out my inner dog person. I, by nature, uh, after squandering most of my youth, you know, just getting it, getting into trouble, being a little juvenile delinquent at age 16, I kind of grew up a little bit, not completely, like, but I started to get at it a little bit where I started to really push myself. And then mainly in my uh, early and mid twenties, I just started really getting into like, just thinking, um, we only have a short period of time here on this earth, right? I don't want to get too deep on you too quick, but um, I was working um, in sales and marketing at that time at a place that had both senior care where I was able to uh, move people in and, and do the initial setup and, and, and getting all the care in place for um, seniors who needed care. And so I would provide relief for those families. A lot like I do today, but today I provide relief for families with puppies, give them direction where uh, initially, you know, while I was training back in the day, I would help you know, seniors uh, get the help that they needed. And on the other part of that building, there was um, a pediatrics unit where we had uh, were tasked with the care of um, kids on ventilators. Um, maybe they ingested drugs um, from their parents or um, you know, people that, that were in their house. And these kids uh, who once had a normal existence um, now, um, you know, not, now again that they were extremely dependent, maybe um, like 80, 90 percent dependent on uh, medical devices and care of others. We had somebody there who was who was a victim of a drive-by. You know, who was a child. Um, we had people. The majority of the, the kids there um, were, were born in that uh, you know said state that they were in. So I was taking care of people who had a crack at living their life. Um, some pe some World War II vets. Um, a lot of people who made it through the, uh, the the Great Depression, and you could see how they were altered by that. And then, so I got to work with both ends of the spectrum. So people who had a fair crack at life and you know, they were kind of knocking on death's door. People who didn't have a fair crack at life. And there I was in the middle, moving them in and, and making sure that my staff was, make sure the rollout was done correctly. So we were, um, I was setting my team up to provide great care. That kind of had me come alive in my early 20s, my early to mid 20s. Between my mom passing me off to my wife who kind of kept me alive during certain periods of my life. Then me kind of having that, that, that wake up call, working in that environment. And then um, obviously having my daughters be born, I just uh, like matured relatively quickly and, and really started to get at it. So my wife brings out my inner dog person. I come alive to um, actually life and wanting to max out, wanting to reach my full potential. Once I started working with dogs in the shelter, I got tired of seeing great dogs get brought back and I saw the potential in them. One time, my a, a dog that I loved that was there for a prolonged period of time, couldn't get a home, it ended up uh, being brought back and then put down. And I just remember just feeling like I was just a pawn in a losing game. And so I basically showed up ready to take dogs out all morning and, and do my thing, got that news, and I just couldn't move. Like I was just like, you know, frozen and I just couldn't, I just couldn't do it. So I just, I walked away, not knowing what my next step was gonna be. I just thought, man, there's gotta be something better I can do to help, help dogs, help people, help them come together. And so I became a dog trainer. Eight years of training dogs, basically any scenario, um, uh, any, uh, you know, uh, aggression case or high level anxieties, um, 
just very unmannerly dogs. You name it, I was in there. And I learned a lot. I probably bit off more than I can chew in, in hindsight. And yeah, most people do as you're developing your career. Um, that's how you get that experience. But I got pretty good at it. Um, I got creative in, in piecing together people's household uh, and their abilities, uh, sometimes lack thereof, uh, with their dog's um, uh, behaviors. And was able to really have have it come together. And so I like that, thinking outside the box, using what limited resources we had, you know, dogs with deficits, owners with uh, monetary or, or time deficits, um, with um, implementation deficits where, you know, th th these dogs maybe required a high level of handling skills where this owner was very novice, but we needed a relief quickly. So I started, I was doing that for about eight years. So yeah, I, tra I trained a handful of puppies and that was great. You know, that, I, I figured like the puppies, um, were like a break for me to, to a certain extent. They're very manually intensive in regards to the information that I have to give to owners and that they have to implement, but at least it wasn't a high stakes game. And at about the eight year mark, I hit another point in my career where I just said, these dogs are going to the big box store. Like the owners will always say the same like three things. He's very cute, he's very smart, and He's trained. He can give paw and he can sometimes do sit and um, and he did really good in his class. Or sometimes they say, you know, he got kicked out of his class. But um, either way, they always said those three things, cute, smart, and formally trained. And the problem that I saw was that these dogs didn't have life skills that could get them through this world in a way that they could understand and react accordingly. And at about that eight year mark of just getting these calls over and over and over again and working with these same dogs and the same owners who I knew by working with the puppies, like we're just getting it done right. I drew another line in the sand. So I only took on puppy training clients. And at that point in time, I had toddlers and I was, I moved from, from Lancaster PA to South Jersey and I had to pick up my job again back in the um, the healthcare industry and in, in the sales and marketing side. I had bills stacking up uh, with you know having a growing little family, and I I drew a line in that sand saying I'm only going to train puppies. Sure enough, who calls me next? One year, one and a half, two year old um, dog who uh, displaying high levels of anxiety and unmannerly behavior, and I referred that client out. I remember looking at the stack of bills while talking to this client, thinking, man, I, I believe I could help this dog. I know I could help this dog. I have the stack of bills that I have to pay, and just feeling that overwhelming feeling of actually saying no. I'm so used to you know, getting done my, my sales and marketing job, working with these boarding puppies that I had, uh, setting up my wife, you know, for a care plan to, you know, take care of these dogs during the day um, to make sure that, you know, potty training and, and nipping and chewing and all that stuff was 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 being addressed. Um, and then, there's, again, just this overwhelming feeling of go, 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 and, and just kind of being like in a rat race, probably how you feel a little bit, um, and maybe with, with your puppy, or maybe you want to avoid that if you don't have your dog yet or if you're a trainer, maybe this really resonates with you. And I said, no, and that sucked. Like I really, I just like remember, not monetarily, like I knew that like, I, like I could, I'm a hustler, I can always, you know, uh, you know, kick it into overdrive, you know, call people back, you know, sign people up. That's never been a problem for me. But not being, saying no to this particular client, it just really, um, I'm always used to, again, taking on, clients, no matter what the situation is, driving a little bit further, you know, just to get the job done. If they were out of my range, I didn't care, you know, I'd, I'd figure it out. Um, and I said, no, but then, and I thought about that all day long um, and it was just stewing in me. Then all of a sudden, about five or six hours later, a puppy training client called back and I actually had the space on my calendar to, to book this client. And I had the mental bandwidth and energy to focus on them more intensely. And that's exactly what I did. And after um, focusing um, on puppy training clients and, and taking on puppy training board and trains um, for a couple years, um, I really had a systematic approach more than ever. One of the biggest mistakes I've made as a business owner uh, one of the biggest mistakes I've made initially in my training career 
is the lacking of systematic approaches. I always used to say, um, you know, we're all adults. We can all, you know, get here on time and you know, take care of the dogs. Or, you know, uh, I'm sure John will meet his, 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 you know, sales goals and he doesn't want me micromanaging him. As I was typically managing people older than me, uh, on paper more experienced than me. And so I came to find out that um, not having a systematic approach, that throwing spaghetti against the wall is flat out dangerous. It's, and not only is it just like um, dangerous to, to meeting your goals, but it just squanders your time. It, it, and it's frustrating. And, and more than anything, it's frustrating. Not uh, giving something 110% and not getting results back, it, it hurts. Especially if, if you're seeking the ad advice uh, from experts and you can't put it together. It, yeah, and so if I could go back in, ch in, a, in a DeLorean for, for my life, I, I would have given myself a more systematic, regimented approach to, to how I gave information to clients and, and how I took care of dogs and how I started my business. But both in my business world as well as my puppy training world, um, I've learned everything the hard way. That way you don't have to. So I truly believe that I did that so I could try everything wrong. So I'm not just telling you from a textbook, hey, this is what I learned and this, this is what I'm going to teach you. That it's just passed down. So yeah, I've learned from a lot of different sources, but um, I've tried everything. And so anything that you might be trying, I can tell you why it doesn't work if it's not in line with with my system or more importantly i can tell you hey it will work but this is why it's not the best option for you so there's about a million and one ways to train a puppy but i truly believe that there's a handful of best ways especially for my clients who might be a novice um, that i can really put on like the the bumpers and the um the bowling alley. So, uh, and I try to give you the most black and white way in regards to approach. But remember, we're not talking just about hands-on work. We're talking in this podcast a lot about the philosophical stuff. So fo follow me here and then I'll give you more of like the black and white, uh, do A, B, C, and D with the handling aspect. And that's, uh, that's mostly contained in my system. Uh, you'll see some of those um, handling drills on my, on my Facebook. So, Let's get to the topic at hand today that I want to go over. How can you expect for your puppy to focus if you can't? It's very easy as a puppy owner to get all focus. There's so much information out there and a lot of it is contradictory that it can leave your head spinning. And that's why I believe having a systematic approach where you can always go back to to the, to the basics to say, what, what are we looking to achieve? Is this in line with what I'm envisioning in my mind? And if you literally look at your dog as a one-year-old dog, and it might be very cute now, if you look at every interaction with that cute little puppy, as and you just envision that dog as a one-year-old dog, it allows you to really take advantage and capitalize on every small interaction and drive that process. And yeah, sometimes that means managing your family because you might not have, have every interaction with your puppy. You know, sometimes you have to manage strangers on the street as they're interacting with your dog. Um, but pretty soon you won't. Pretty soon your dog will just maintain a, a sit stay even if a stranger tries to, to pet it um, and doesn't stick to, you know, kind of like their end of the script. Anyway, in the meantime, know that until you get to that point where your puppy doesn't need spotted, it doesn't need somebody to guide it through uh, having good manners, that it can just maintain good manners on its own, even if the person petting that dog is uh, a little over the top or says, I don't care if the dog jumps on me. Your dog just should be in the habit of not jumping. Um, so until your dog can kind of carry that weight of, of mannerly behavior by itself, you're going to have to be intentional with every little interaction that you have with that dog, knowing that it's worth it. Anytime I've done something that's that's great, that is a long-term game changer in mine, in my family's life, in my client's life, and the dogs that I serve, uh, their lives, 
I, I've often struggled and I've always had to tell myself, it's worth it, it's worth it. And think about the things that you've achieved in your life. You, you haven't made it this far where you haven't achieved some really big things and things that you had to constantly recommit yourself to. And so, of course, nobody ever stays perfectly focused. I listened to a handful of podcasts where um, the, the one guy who I follow, he says he's the world's most disciplined man. And then I listen to people who are like maybe like Navy SEALs that have been in extreme combat situations and just put themselves through some grueling uh, tests of discipline and, um, and, and like this inner fortitude and just challenge themselves. And I think, man, what I've done is nothing, you know, really. Um, it, it all depends on how you compare yourself. But um, let's focus, you know, let, let, let's change that microscope up and, and go from like a, a zoomed out view, boom, into yours and your puppy's little, you know, little view in your household. And it's the same thing. It's a constant recommitment. So if you've ever said, hey, I'm going to fit in this wedding dress, you know, by the time um, this said date rolls around, and you do. Or you say, you know, I'm gonna pay for this wedding. Um, and you come up with that money, you save money, you stop spending, you brown bag that lunch, you are able to pay for that wedding. Or you say, um, I'm gonna get this, like said, like job or, or, or career uh, growth. Whatever that thing is that you've committed yourself to and you've gone back and forth, but you've always kind of got back on the horse and recommitted yourself, this puppy is going to require the same from you. Or if you're a puppy trainer, you're a dog trainer, your career is going to require the same amount of chutzpah, that ability just to um, be dynamic, continue to get back on that horse, continue to learn, and continue to grow yourself. So you're going to have known milestones, and it's my goal, almost like a Sherpa who's you know bringing, who's bringing a climber up a mountain. I've... I've scaled this mountain over and over and over again, and I've faced different climates. You know, scaling the same mountain where I had uh, like a puppy lab with a, a Vietnam vet who was pretty disabled. Um, so you know, we we got this dog on the treadmill, which I don't do treadmill training online. Um, that's something I would do, you know, locally in person. And we, we did a couple other things. You know, we solicited the help of like a dog walker and, and a few other things. But imagine climbing up a mountain and, you know, as a Sherpa. And someday, you know, some, some, some summits you have some, some good weather and everything goes pretty well. And then other times you have either a person who, you know, something's not right. Whether it be the person, the weather, the equipment, something fails. So no, no matter what you know going up this mountain that you're going to have failures. The difference is, what do you do when you fail? Do you fail forward? Do you learn from it? Do you take it on the chin and, and understand why it's your fault? That's a hard thing to do uh, when you're doing everything that you can and you're putting 110% effort in it. Because it might not be your fault due to lack of effort, but it might be your fault due to lack of understanding. My goal is to do two things. Give you that understanding in a systematic way and be here to encourage you to know that there's going to be ups and downs. Again, like if, if you were going through some health goals and you might have one week where you're, you're lifting more than ever at the gym and you're on that treadmill longer than ever, but you gained weight, that can be defeating. But it's also normal. Maybe you have more muscle, you know? So uh, you might be sitting there looking at the scale and I might say, hold up, you know, as your trainer, I'm, I'm putting you through some, some other like, um, like, like test to find out your percentage of, of muscle to fat. And I'm gonna tell you, you actually moved forward. You put on more muscle. And so knowing the differences of like what like known milestones are, it makes it so much easier as you go through these peaks and valleys as, as a puppy owner. Because no matter what, even in my system, you will. It's just the highs will be higher and the lows won't be nearly as low. And I'm going to explain to you how to get out of those valleys when you're in them. Um, and I'm going to, when you're up when you're up top and you're like, hey, hey, you know what? I'm doing pretty well. 
Um, I feel like I've reached my goals. I'm going to tell you, you have it. You're just getting a little bit of relief. So don't, don't get too happy. Sometimes I can be a little bit of a killjoy. Again, I have a sales background. So if we had a good month, I would just be skeptical, skeptical of what's going to happen next month. Or if we had a bad month, I wouldn't care. I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm going to get at it next month. So no matter what, just having that level head of what's next, what can I be doing? How can I continue to drive this process and remain focused? knowing that there's a little bit of an investment phase when you're still con converting from throwing spaghetti against the wall and it's just sh through sheer sweat equity and effort versus being a practitioner, being decisive, knowing where your dog's at in its daily regimen and being able to drive the process without even thinking. So my goal is to get you from the non-thinking, just doing, you know, head spinning puppy owner to um, being able to take a look at where your dog's at, both in the big grand scheme of things and its overall development, as well as daily management, and then more specifically for those said scenarios where you're actually doing hands-on training with your dog to do something, or you're doing behavioral modification where you don't want your dog to do something. So the whole point of this is focus. And if you can't remain focused on a long-term project that does have short-term goals that we will meet, medium-term goals that we will meet, and then remembering why we're doing this, and that's for your dog to be socialized, mannerly, and responsive, and live its best life, and for you to truly serve your dog, this isn't for, to have you get a couple obedience commands or... Um, have your dog stop doing a couple things like potty training or um, nipping or, or chewing. This is for making your dog max out on its potential. With that said, I mentioned at the start of this first podcast that this is for two main groups of people, puppy owners and dog trainers who want some community, you know, just want some ideas to hopefully encourage them and um, just have them think deeper and maybe even give me some ideas, throw some challenges at me, say, yeah, Pat, that's all well and good, but what do you think about this approach? And I might say, hey, I, I like that, but this is why I like mine better, or you know what, that's a good idea. This podcast isn't for people who aren't going to own this process and really lean into it. When your muscles burn at the gym, do you feel that burn and do you say, I'm getting closer to my goals? I, I literally feel that burning and it excites you where you're literally going to move your arms, move, you know, whatever, you know, body part you're working on until it physically can't move anymore and disregard the burn and lean in to in that moment, what seems like pain. Are you going to stop lifting when you feel that burn or are you going to stop lifting when your, your body can no longer move, that your mind has pushed your body as far as it can go. And so I want you to dedicate. I want that level of focus from you before we get started here and know that you're going to have to lean in to, to some of that learning pain. And I'm not talking about the, the, the nipping pain or you know anything that the frustration, anything like that. I'm talking about the learning curve. Because as you embark on figuring out an, a simple but very intricate creature, as I bring two different species together, as you seek to understand your dog, there's going to be a learning curve. But the nice thing is, and remember, I've been here with thousands and thousands of owners, is it gets easier. All of a sudden, things start clicking. You start having all these tipping points, and the nipping uh, is now tugging. The chewing is now chewing on the appropriate items. The confinement gets easier, which makes the potty training game easier. And then all of a sudden you start to see nodes of success and you start to get happy. And then what happens is you lose focus. It's like if you're trying to pay off credit card debt and you got you know two of your cards paid off and you feel a little bit of relief and then you quit. You know, you're shooting for a six pack, but you get a flat belly and then you say, ah, it's good enough. So I'm going to make sure that as you feel either relief or you feel a little bit of pain that you keep going and you remain focused. So take that commitment on the front end and keep coming back to that dog that you're envisioning in your mind one, you know, one year from now. 
and think about short, medium, and long-term goals. Short-term, in that moment. Is it okay for you to allow your dog to jump on your kids? No. If you don't want it to jump on your guests and jump on you, then no, it's not okay. Medium term, again, you're thinking week over week goals. Like what, where do I gotta be next week to um, meet our objective of X? And then long term, um, is what you're doing in the short and medium term gonna add up to the long term? Long term, I don't care that much about, to be honest with you. I know that if I do short term, and I do, uh, that's mainly all I focus on. To be blatantly honest with you, I, I don't really think too much about medium and long-term goals because I know that if I do what I got to do right now in the present, in this moment, if I can just win this little mini battle of making sure that my dog doesn't you know, jump or that my dog is actually chewing or that my dog is playing tug if, if, as I roll out your dog's daily regimen, if you can win the moment, you can win the minute, you can win the hour, you can win the day. So um, just commit yourself to those little short-term, um, those little short-term goals, and look, look at your look at your day almost like you have two really big flip charts. If you've ever been to like a seminar or something like that where they had the big old sharpie and the big yellow three foot by two foot, um, you know, like notepad, envision two of those notepads on easels. And written over top of the one, it says training. Whoosh, a big underline underneath training. And then on the other notepad, it says detraining. That means you're developing bad habits. Whoosh, underline that one. Now, every time your dog does something good, boop, you put a uh, tally mark underneath the training side. And then every time your dog does something that is a bad habit, boop, you put a tally mark under the detraining side. There's no middle notepad. You're either training your dog to do what you want and developing good habits, or you're detraining your dog and your dog is developing bad habits. There is no middle ground. One of the things that the Bible basically does is it spells out everything for you. It, it, in so many words, it says you're either running towards the light or towards the darkness. There's not a lot of middle ground. It spells out exactly what you need to do. And I want you to look at these little short-term goals as to keep you in focus um, and really have you understand that you're either training or detraining your dog. It's as simple as that. So yes, you're going to think about your medium term goals. So week over week, you can be where I need you to be, where your puppy needs you to be, where your family needs you to be. Just keep coming back to those short term goals. What can I do today? What can I do right now? What's my next step going to be? And just drive that process. So re re remain focused with driving that process putting it into place what you do know how to do. You don't have to know all the answers at this point in the game. This is the first podcast you're, you might be listening to. Uh, you might just be taking your journey. You might not even have your dog yet. But doing what you know how to do makes it less overwhelming. You're just winning that little victory. You don't need to know everything yet. I can tell you, um, it was a daunting task for me to get to this point where I had to figure out all the technologies and social media. I love connecting with people in person, over the phone, all those old school ways. But social media, I'm, I don't understand. I'm, I'm understanding it now. Technology, I'm not the biggest tech guru, but I'll tell you this much. In the last two and a half years, I've been through some trials and tribulations trying to launch my online puppy training course and, um, and I've traveled all over the country and, I've, and I know more about how that aspect of, um, again, technology and social media and, and, and connecting all those different pieces work. And there's a lot to it. There's a reason why so many uh, people want to do what I've done and haven't been successful. And I know why. There's a lot to it. There's points where I you know, took that break as I was scaling the mountain and I had to regather myself or just gave myself a season of being off and then came back and hit it harder and was upset at myself for, you know, taking a break and said, you know, you could have powered through that. And sure I could have, but I'm also a dad and I'm also a human. So I, I know what it's like to have discipline, have discipline, lean in, grow, 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 and then also hit a wall. But I also know what it's like to get back on that horse, ride that sucker harder and faster and achieve. So this podcast is for 
two people, puppy owners, puppy trainers. And essentially you're one and the same, but most importantly, this podcast is for people who want it. So hopefully this has leaves you inspired. I'm gonna go over some more practical things, but remember you have to maintain focus as you're um, climbing up this puppy mountain. And I'm telling you, it's worth it. Tell yourself that every step of the way, it's worth it. All right, guys, I'll see you in my next podcast. Remember, champion puppy owners, action over anxiety, discipline equals freedom. Take the next step, do what you know how to do. Drive the puppy training process. Truly commit yourself to this, hit it hard for a short period of time so you can stop working on your dog and simply enjoy them. I'll see you next time. Peace.